Greetings and welcome to chapter 13, The Courts. Now, you may recall from previous videos, particularly from chapters 4 and 5, we took a look at some Supreme Court cases that had a profound and significant impact on society. Well, in this video, we're going to be taking a deeper dive into the U.S. Supreme Court. We're going to be looking at the confirmation process, how cases are selected at the Supreme Court, the various types of law, uh, judicial review, and we're going to conclude with a discussion on judicial philosophies. One quick side note, uh, we do have a visitor today. Um, my cat Izzy is with us, so if my slides jump ahead or if you uh, hear her, um, you know, her color or anything like that, just know it's, our, it's my cat Izzy. So, Let's, let's, uh, let's dive into the Supreme Court. Okay, so remember that Articles 1, 2, and 3 establishes the three differing branches of government. Right? Article 1 establishes the legislature, Article 2 establishes the, the executive, and Article 3 establishes the judiciary, specifically the U.S. Supreme Court. And you may also recall that the... the that the Constitution, Article 3 itself, is only 377 words. And just a quick reminder on that. But, so, as the name implies, Article 3 of the Constitution establishes the highest court in the land. So, the highest court that anyone can appeal a case in the United States is, in fact, the U.S. Supreme Court. So you may also recall that we talked about terms of office, right? We got in uh, Congress and, and the president. Well, likewise here, there is a term or a schedule that they follow, right? Uh, it's the first Monday in October until the first Monday in October of the following year. So that's interesting to note. Note also that the Supreme Court, saw, the Supreme Court serves, I should say, as the appellate court. Again, this is the highest court that we can appeal to, right? And that all the justices, right? The chief justice along with the uh, associate justices, that they are appointed by a president of the United States and confirmed by the U.S. Senate. So currently we have nine justices and they are appointed, right? Um, each one was appointed by a previous president or a president, and confirmed by the U.S. Senate. So, I'd like to take a moment real quick to talk about the elaborate systems of checks and balances that the U.S. Constitution and the framework of the Constitution gave us, right? So, remember that the judiciary can interpret the Constitution. They have the ability to interpret law and to interpret act uh, action taken by government officials and and interpret it through the Constitution. So did, did this law that passed by Congress, is it constitutional? Is it constitutional? Um, there's, you know, a particular uh, executive order that a president signed. Is that lawful? Does it violate the Constitution? Right? So it serves as a check are not only on the legislature, but also on the president, on the executive. Well, the nomination process is the check that the president has on the judiciary because the president gets to a point when there's a vacancy on the court, they get to appoint a nominee. Now, it's also a check and balance on the judiciary and on the president that the Senate gets to confirm gets to have these hearings on whether or not they will confirm or deny this nominee that the president has put forth. So it's a checks and balance. But if you were to try, if you were to guess who has the biggest check here, right? Uh, in other words, who has um, the most, mm, who has the most ability to put a check on one of these forms of government, or one of these one of these branches of government. What do you think it would be? I'll give you a second here. 
And if you said the the executive, mm, but if you said the legislature, absolutely. Let's take a look at, into the legislature and what kind of checks and balances they have on the U.S. Supreme Court. So there is there is a growing discussion about whether or not Congress should or should not increase the size of the U.S. Supreme Court. In other words, increase the size of how many justices or increase the number of justices that serve on the U.S. Supreme Court. There is a discussion brewing about that. And Congress has that authority. Congress, remember, Congress is up for re-election, right? The House of Representatives, the lower house, is up for re-election every two years. The U.S. Senate, the upper division, the upper house, they're up for re-election every six years. What does that mean for you and I? That means that the framers of the Constitution made it explicit where members of Congress, they are held accountable frequently to you and I, to the voters, which is another reason why it's extremely important to vote. Um, I'm digressing. So let's dive into the size of the court, okay? The Constitution grants Congress the power to set the number of justices. So let me just say that one more time, just to be clear, okay? The U.S. Constitution grants Congress, not the President, not, not, not the Supreme Court, Congress. The U.S. Constitution grants Congress the power the authority and the responsibility to set the number of justices that serve not only in the U.S. Supreme Court, but the federal court system that we have. So the Judiciary Act of 1789 set the number of justices at six, with one chief justice and five associate justices. Okay. Um, the Judiciary Act of 1801, uh, that act reduced the number of justices on the Supreme Court to four, right? Um, so we've, we've fluctuated here. Um, Congress, through passages of judicial acts, have changed the number of justices that have served on the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, these Judiciary Acts, like the Judiciary Act of, 19, of 1789, the Judiciary Act of 1801, the Judiciary Act of 1869, these acts passed by Congress, these laws passed by Congress, they were in part, specifically the organization of the federal court system, this was in part a, an addressing of U.S. expansion. Now, you got to remember, right, when, when the United States was first born, right, we had about, what, 13 colonies that formed into states? So the United States was roughly about 13 states, right? It grew rapidly, and now we have a total of 50 states in this union, right? In the United States, we have 50 states. So as the United States expanded, so did the need for our court system, right? Because as we obtained more land, as we grew and, and as we expanded, the legal system was stretched. So Congress has fluctuated the number of seats on the Supreme Court in part to reflect our expansion. Right. So uh, over time, like I said, this, the court size has fluctuated uh, from four to five to as high as 10. Right? And the Judiciary Act of 1869 fixed the current number of justices to nine. So just to be clear, does Congress have the authority to add more seats to the U.S. Supreme Court and therefore require the president to appoint? more justices. Yes. Yes. The U.S. Constitution grants Congress that power. And Congress is uh, held responsible, it, it, they're, they're up for accountability every two to six years through elections with you and I as the voters. So 
this makes sense. That says, so this is explicit. This isn't like some kind of implied elastic, uh, some kind of a um, um, application of the elastic clause. No, no, no. This is uh, pretty explicit in the U.S. Constitution. In fact, I would encourage you to go to go read Articles 1, 2, and 3. Okay? They're kind of short reads if you, if you put it in context of books, right? But anyways, I'm digressing. The point I'm trying to get here is Congress gets to determine this. So it begs the question, where do you stand? Do you think Congress should increase the size? I mean, after all, we have 12 circuit courts. So shouldn't we have one justice serving on the Supreme Court from each circuit? So therefore, we should have 12 uh, justices? Or do you think that this is packing the court and that this is some kind of political maneuvering just to bring some kind of balance to the Supreme Court? What's your take? Let me know. It's a good question. Let's move on. So the selection process, right? I just mentioned uh, the confirmation hearings, right? Let's dive into this. Let's dive into this. So presidential appointment. The president, whoever it may be, whoever is the current president, and there is a vacancy at the court, right? The U.S. president, the president gets to appoint a nominee, right? They get to name someone. Now, we should note that they're not going to pick someone that politically disagrees with them, right? I mean, that makes no sense. If, hypothetically speaking, if I'm a Republican judge, what I, uh, sorry, if I'm a Republican president, would I want to appoint someone who leans Democrat? No. And likewise, if I'm a Democrat president, would I want to appoint a Republican judge? No. Because we lack the compatibility, ideological compatibility. So a president is always going to pick someone, someone that matches their ideology. Now, it's not going to be like verbatim, like you th that they're going to appoint some judge that thinks identically to them, right? Because that's pretty much impossible to find. But what they will do is, you know, overall large strokes. Do you, uh, what's your philosophy? How would you handle things? Uh, what's, your, what's your take on, you know, political issues, right? That, that type of, of ideological compatibility is what a president looks, looks for. And by the way, let me just go ahead and put this out there now, that we feel the effects of a presidential administration well after that president leaves office. Just to be clear about that, uh, why and how? The Supreme Court. These justices serve a lifetime appointment. This is a lifetime. You get appointed to the Supreme Court, um, you're there basically for life, assuming good conduct. We'll talk about that in just a moment as well. But, but just note that you're there for life. So we feel the effects of that president through that nominee, through that Supreme Court justice. Right? So when a president gets to a point a certain number of justices, and if there's so many vacancies, we will feel the effects of that administration well down the road, years after that administration came to an end, whether they were term limited or whether they uh, were defeated in the, uh, you know, in the re-election bid, whatever the case may be, we will feel the effects of that presidency for years to come. And that's the way it is, because again, these justices ideologically are compatible with the president that appoints them, which again, makes sense, right? So checks and balances, right? Uh, I've, already meant, I've already talked about this, right? But just to hammer the point one more time, right? The president must receive Senate confirmation. He gets to, the president, he or she gets to make this appointment, gets to make this nominee, you know, hey, I want this individual to be, uh, to fill this vacancy on the court. Great. All right. The U.S. Senate now gets to look at that nominee and have this what's known as a contentious job interview. These confirmation hearings, I highly encourage you, go watch as, as many as you can of them that, that you can find. 
they're fascinating, they're interesting, they're long, they're, it, it's a long process, but it's worth it. Like, this is a contentious job interview. Since they are being appointed for life, and by the way, the Constitution does not give any criteria to be a judge. Not like experience in education. No. So this job interview, it's very contentious, very detailed. Indeed. Um, because again, it's a lifetime appointment. They want to make sure that these nominees are up to snuff. Make sure that they are, um, you know, capable, that they are knowledgeable, that they have the temperament, that they, um, that they are apolitical to serve in this capacity, right? So it's a job interview, and not all job interviews go smooth. We have some controversial hearings, confirmation hearings. Um, that we can point to and have a discussion on, right? Uh, Robert Bork in seventeen eight and sorry, <laughs> seventeen <laughs> in nineteen eighty seven rather, uh, there was a concern that Demo the Democrats had a concern over Reagan's nominee here, Robert Bork. They had a concern that he would roll back uh, certain civil rights. And that he would roll back and he would advocate on the court to roll back certain civil rights. So the Senate said, no. No, we're denying this confirmation. So Reagan had to choose a different nominee. Clarence Thomas in 1991. This was cont uh, contentious and controversial because he was, he was facing allegations by Anita Hill of sexual harassment. The Senate confirmed him anyways, but this surrounded his confirmation. Um, the confirmation, and I remember watching this live on C-SPAN, um, that this was the center of the discussion regarding his confirmation, not his necessarily uh, approach to judicial practices or judicial philosophies or uh, how he believes in story decisis or not. No, no, no. It centered on those allegations. So it was, it was controversial. Uh, another controversial uh, hearing or confirmation hearing was Harriet Myers in 2005. She, the concern that, that faced the Senate and the Senate expressed to the nominee and also to the Bush administration was that she was too close, too close of a friend to President Bush who had nominated her. So the fear that they had was that she would be too, what's the word I'm looking for? That instead of being apolitical, instead of being impartial, that she would do the will of the administration. That was the concern. So um, during this, during this, this uh, controversial hearing, uh, Harriet Myers chose to withdraw her nomination. And of course, Brett Kavanaugh, 2018 nominee. This was very controversial because of what was happening, right? The, uh, on two folds, uh, two fronts to be frank. Uh, one was the political side and the other one was the allegations of sexual assault that he was being accused of. These are two separate issues to talk about um, because one of them is very political um, and I would, again, I would encourage you, go find as many of these um, confirmation hearings you can find. Go watch them. Being serious. Um, don't take my word. <laughs> but go watch these. Um, there were two sides here. Uh, one side was he, he, Brett Kavanaugh, made the process extremely political by saying that somehow this was, uh, that hit, that the, um, those who wish that he would not be appointed, that his that his confirmation would be denied, that this was somehow a political hit job orchestrated by the Clintons. So he, he made this process extremely political when, when there was no need. He, a Republican president, that is Trump, 
appointed him and he was facing a confirmation hearing that was ran by the Republicans. So, and Brett Kavanaugh solved uh, for several, for other Republican presidents like Bush. So, this was a slam dunk. There was no need to make it a political, to make a political statement. Let me put it that way. Then on the other hand, um, the allegations of being, uh, of sexual assault, that he was basically drunk at a party and assaulted um, an individual. Her name was Dr. Ford. So this was, this was um, controversial. Uh, like Clarence Thomas, though, I probably mentioned this just a second ago, just to make sure, uh, he was appointed. His confirmation was appointed and he is serving. Likewise, Brett Kavanaugh, despite the controversy, he was appointed and his appointment, his confirmation was approved. And he is now currently serving as a judge on the U.S. Supreme Court. So before I move on, I've got another question because I'm loaded with questions. What's your take? What do you think about Brett Kavanaugh? I would encourage you, again, go watch these videos. Go watch his confirmation hearing. Do you think he made it political? Do you think I might be making smoke out of nothing? Do you think he should have been confirmed? What's your take? Let me know. Let's move on. So, while there are no formal qualifications established by the Constitution, there is some common background that the justices possess. So let's take a look at these. Right? Um, they op often have law degrees from um, prestigious schools, um, previous judicial experience. Right? Uh, the age is equal or less or greater than 50. Um, so, the, so that's interesting to know. Uh, in terms of the ethnicity and gender, traditionally, white and male throughout U.S. history. So these are some common traits or common backgrounds for which our justices have. But we are starting to see some diversity come to the U.S. Supreme Court. So let's talk about this. Uh, Third Good Marshall became the first black justice in 1967. Sandra Day O'Connor became the first woman justice in 1981. Uh, Sonia Sotomayor became the first Hispanic justice in 2009. And uh, Kendra John, uh, Brown Jackson became the first black woman justice in 2022. So we are starting to see some diversity in terms of um, um, demographics right onto the Supreme Court. What do you make of that? Do you think it doesn't matter? Does it matter at all? Or do you think there's something here that this is a sign not only of growth of the nation, but this is a sign of, you know, minorities and women becoming more part of the process? What's your take? Again, I'm loaded with these questions. So how cases are selected, okay? How cases are selected. The interesting thing about the U.S. Supreme Court is that Congress gave, let me say that again, Congress gave what's known as discretionary jurisdiction to the U.S. Supreme Court. What does that mean? That means that you and I, we are not guaranteed a, we do not have a right to have our case heard at the U.S. Supreme Court. Let me say it again. You and I, we have no right, we have no guarantee that our case, no matter how important it may be to you and I, we do not have a guarantee to have our case heard before the Supreme Court. We don't. Why? Because they got what's known as discretionary jurisdiction. Meaning that the Supreme, the Supreme Court has this custom because Congress gave it to them in which a case will be heard if and when four out of the nine justices decide to do so. So it's called the rule of four. 
if four out of the nine justices agree to hear a case, they'll hear the case. Otherwise, whatever decision was made at the lower court right before it got to the Supreme Court, that's the decision that stands. Okay, the writ, my Latin is horrible, okay, but I, so I'm going to shorten this. The, uh, sometimes we abbreviate this as sot anyways. So the writ of sot. And this is an order of the Supreme Court calling upon the records of the lower court so that a case may be reviewed. Okay? So the Supreme Court may issue this uh, writ of sot uh, to have all the records from the lower previous court to be sent to the Supreme Court so they may review. Okay? So, but again, need to hammer this one more time. Discretionary jurisdiction. Okay? That if four Supreme Court justices decide to hear a case, they'll hear it. But if only three or two or one, no matter how important that case may be, it will not be heard. Whatever decision at that lower court, whatever it was, that's what stands. So the criteria used to select cases, right? We could spend an entire 16-week semester actually diving into uh, case selection and the U.S. Supreme Court as a whole, okay? But in short, some criteria that justices may use to determine whether or not do we hear this case or not center on whether or not there's disagreement among lower courts. Is, is there a con uh, do we lack a consensus of a ruling on this issue, whatever this issue may be. Where there's disagreements among the lower courts, then okay, then uh, this, is, th this is worthwhile of our consider, at least our consideration, right? Uh, civil liberties or civil rights are involved uh, specifically, right? Remember, our civil liberties, they are, remember that the Bill of Rights this is not a, hey, y'all, here are your rights. Here's what you can do. That's not what that is. It is a protection against government intrusion on certain rights that have been um, explicitly written out. But no, but and by no means, and this is what I believe the Ninth Amendment, if I remember correctly, it's the Ninth Amendment to the Bill of Rights, um, it basically it gives way in saying something to the effect of we can't I'm paraphrasing a lot here okay and I'm adding some warning here so please forgive me but we can't list all rights that that we as humans possess we can't do that so just note that this is a blanket you know whatever is not enumerated if it's a right they have right um, so the point I'm trying to get at is if these are involved the Supreme Court will be interested in hearing it. Right? Uh, appeals from state courts, uh, an emergency situation, or the U.S. government is a party, at, you know, if, if they are one of the parties in, a, in this litigation, then yeah, the Supreme Court is going to have an interest in that. Right? These are some factors that, that go into case selection, whether or not the Supreme Court will actually hear a case. So let's talk about decisions. Right? Decisions are announced before and during summer. So during the summertime, you know, um, shortly before summer and during summer, you will see those who are politically active, those who are uh, politically involved, those who are watching the Supreme Court for any potential controversial uh, issues having a ruling on you will see us potentially being nervous <laughs> during the summertime because we don't know what the court will do per se, right? Uh, so, so uh, the summertime is an interesting time uh, for those interested in the U.S. Supreme Court. So there are um, three differing types of opinions we need to know, okay? The first is a majority opinion. This is an opinion of the court in which more than half of the nine justices agree with the decision. With whatever decision they determined, more than half of the nine 
agreed. A concurring opinion, <clears throat> sorry, a concurring opinion is an opinion written by a justice who agrees with the court's majority opinion, but has a different reasoning for doing so. The, the way I like to, <clears throat> I like to use an analogy, to be frank, with concurring opinions, okay? Um, do you know of a family member or maybe a friend that they have like a special way, like let's say you and a family member or a friend decide to go watch a movie, right? Hypothetically, bear with me, that you decide to go watch a movie. You know, you think you have the fastest way to get there, but your friend or your family member takes a completely different route that, that to you seems out of the way. But for whatever reason, that's the way they like to take because they think it's faster. Right? You come to the same conclusion. You come to the same movie theater. You meet up at the exact same place. But how you get there is different. That's what we're talking about with this concurring opinion. That I that this that the a concurring opinion is I agree with the overall decision, but I disagree with how we got here. I disagree with the reasoning for the outcome. That's a concurring opinion. A dissenting opinion is an opinion written by a justice who disagrees with the majority opinion of the court. Not only do they disagree with going to the movie theater, they definitely disagree with how you got there. <laughs> but. Um, with the route that you took. So this is a complete rejection of the overall ruling. That's a dissenting opinion. So, yeah. Movie theaters and the Supreme Court. Who would have thought? So, both sides make all arguments during the term. So when the Supreme Court does, in fact, hear a case, okay, um, both sides will make arguments, legal arguments, and we have two sides, right, plaintiffs are side A, respondents are side B, specifically in civil cases. In criminal cases, you have the plaintiff, that is the state, and you have the defendant or defendants, right? So, what is the societal impact of the Supreme Court rulings? We could, we could take an entire week on this, seriously. Uh, look no further than what we, our discussions on Brown v. Board of Education, or before that one, um, Parsi v. Ferguson, Brown v. Board of Education, Roe v. Wade. Um, these Supreme Court cases, they have a profound impact on society. Re regardless of where we stand on those issues, right? Uh, particularly with Roe v. Wade. Um, regardless of where we stand on that, that decision, whether whether it struck down or not, that had a profound impact on society. So, what's that impact? It's significant, <laughs> right? It, it's it's profound. It is profound. So there are differing types of law, right? Um, there's about four, roughly four. Right? There's common law which is the pattern of law developed by judges through case decisions largely based on precedents. So what does this mean? Well, that, that this law exists not because necessarily that Congress deemed it so and that they wrote this piece of legislation, but because of previous court decisions upheld a particular principle and that principle is now used as the guiding glue, if you will, of the law, right? A constitutional law, that is law that involves the reading and the interpretation of the Constitution. How is the First Amendment applied? How is the uh, Establishment Clause applied? Is it, uh, or the, uh, ex the Free Exercise Clause? Uh, is this case, or is this particular situation a violation of due process or a violation of my Second Amendment rights, whatever the case, whatever the issue may be, right? constitutional law invo invo involves reading the Constitution and interpreting the Constitution. We're going to dive into a discussion 
about the interpretation of the Constitution in just a moment because that is very important to note. Let's keep, let's, let's keep going. We have statutory law. This is a law written and approved by the legislative body. So remember, right, the federal level, the national legislature is the U.S. Congress. At the state level, we have the state legislatures. Uh, the state legislature and the Congress both possess the ability to make and pass laws because they're the, both of them are the legislative branch. Right, so statutory law are laws that have been passed by legislatures. So, if we're talking about natural, uh, national uh, statutory laws, we're literally talking about laws passed by the U.S. Congress. If we're talking about st state statutory laws, then we're talking about laws passed by the state legislature, whether that's the Texas legislature here in Texas or potentially. You know, an, another any other state, the California uh, legislature, the New York state legislature, uh, the Massachusetts state legislature, etc. Uh, it's laws written and approved by the legislative body. Administrative law are rules adopted by the bureaucracy in order to implement a statutory law or executive action. So. Congress gets to make these laws. The legislature gets to make laws. The executive branch is tasked with implementation of those laws. And through that, through that implementation of laws, we, they have the bureaucracy makes rules to help guide and to help implement said piece of legislation that's probably most likely pretty vague, right? So this ministry of law are just rules that are adopted by the bureaucracy in order to implement laws passed by the legislature. So now let's dive into judicial review. Okay? Judicial review is the power of the courts to review actions taken by the other branches of government and the states and to rule on whether those actions are constitutional or not. So, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she, she said in an interview um, that Matt Berry, I'm paraphrasing a lot here, so bear with me, but Matt, it is implied that the Supreme Court has this power to strike down a law or an action a government official or a governmental body has taken as unconstitutional or not. It's implied because it's part of the three branches of government. The judiciary is a branch of government, right? Article 1, Article 2, and Article 3. And that each branch serves as a check and balance on the other branches, We've already talked about this ad nauseum throughout the throughout these uh, lectures, so I'm not going to dive too much. I'm not going to rehash that too much, but she made the comment that how it was implied that the Supreme Court had judicial review. But Marbury v. Madison, this Supreme Court case, solidified explicitly that the U.S. Supreme Court has judicial review. That is the power to review actions taken by other branches of government and deem them unconstitutional or not. Right? So, like I said, some um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she made this comment about how it was implied, but Marbury, Von, Marbury v. Madison makes it now explicit. And that's interesting to know. Um, and, and we should note that's important that the Supreme Court has that authority and power. After all, they are a check and balance on the other branches of government. So, areas of judicial review. So, we're talking about interpreting the Constitution. We're talking about constitutional laws, presidential action, um, federal regulations, state laws, right? These are areas that are subjected to the judicial review of the judiciary, 
<laughs> but so interpreting the Constitution, uh, uh, congressional laws, right, legislature, um, the, the uh, laws passed by Congress, right, executive orders and other actions taken by the president or anyone else in the executive branch, federal regulations that are established uh, not only by statutory law, but also by administrative law, uh, state laws. Right? This is all subject to judicial review. So there are two key concepts that we really, really need to know something about. Right? And that is president and stare decisis. Okay? These two are very important for us to have a good grasp on, particularly when we start talking about the Supreme Court or when we start studying, or we start uh, looking at the Supreme Court closer, whatever the case may be, we need to know about these two concepts. Um, the first here, presidents, is the principles or guidelines established by courts in previous, earlier cases that frame the ongoing operation of the courts steering the direction of the entire system. But stare decisis is the principles by which the courts rely on past decisions and their precedents when making decisions in new cases. So, when you watch these, these uh, sub, um, confirmation hearings, which I hope you do, I really do, when you watch them, you will hear senators asking, what's your take or how do you interpret stare decisis? Meaning, well, the, do you believe in the principles that whatever decision was previously made, that decision stands? Because that's ultimately what stare decisis is. It's uh, let the previous decision of the Supreme Court stand. That's what stare decisis is. So you will hear frequently, specifically any nomination after uh, Roe v. Wade. What's his take on stare decisis and how would you apply it to Roe v. Wade? Right? These are okay, th this is a question that's frequently asked. Right? And in regards on our political take on that particular question, in regards to how we feel about Roe v. Wade, put that to a side for just a second here. And let, let's just focus on this, this idea that the previous decision stands. Right? The principles of previous decisions that will guide our decision on this new case that is relevant to, the, to that particular case that was previously ruled on. Right? That's what stare decisis is. So yeah. So now let's engage in a conversation of our final topic here. Let's dive into judicial philosophy because this is extremely important for us to make note of. Okay. It's very important for us to make note of this because this is where it gets interesting. <laughs> right? Judicial philosophies are extremely interesting. There are two types. Right? And, and when we talk about judicial philosophies, we'll talk about the philosophies for which judges um, adhere to and use as a way to make decisions in these highly complex, sometimes highly profile and highly controversial cases, but there are two, um, two camps of thought regarding how, um, how the judiciary, how judges make decisions. There are two camps here. Let, let's talk about the first one, judicial restraint. That is a, a judicial philosophy in which a judge is more likely to let the decisions or actions of previous branches of government. So let them stand. So in other words, judicial restraint is, yes, we have the power, because we are the judiciary, we are the Supreme Court, we have the power to overrule and to overturn a previous court case. Yes, we can. We have that power. We have that ability. We are here in this case now. We need to make a decision. And that relates to that previous case. But judicial restraint says, just because we can doesn't mean we should. So judicial restraint is, is, is applying stare decisis and saying the previous decision on a case, the previous decision on this particular matter stands. 
That's the judicial restraint. Judicial activism, on the other hand, is a philosophy in which a justice is more likely to overturn decisions or rule or rule actions by other branches unconstitutional. But specifically in an attempt to broaden individual rights or liberties. So this idea of judicial activism. Um, this idea that we can't overturn, so we should overturn. There are certain cases that may not. You may recall from a previous, from a previous case, uh, previous lecture about a Buck v. Bell and how I probably made a comment something to the effect of it was a, a travesty, or something to the effect of. Uh, this is a dark stain like Plessy v. Ferguson on the Supreme Court's record. I made, I, I made some kind of comment like that. I can't remember exactly what forward what I said. But should, it, should the government hear another case like Buck v. Bell? Should they just overturn that Supreme Court case from the, the 1920s? Just because you can, should you? But, so what's your take on this? What's your specific take? Do you, do you agree with judicial restraint or judicial activism? Do you want to see the courts trying to broaden individual rights and liberties more? Do you want to see courts overruling and overturning previous decisions? Or do you want them to, sh to show restraint, leave previous um, decisions, let those stand and make new rulings on things that haven't been ruled on before. What's your take on this? What, what, what do you believe should, should be the philosophy that our judges take? And then the next question beyond that is, do we voice that concern? Do we voice that, that opinion to our senators when they are hearing when, when, when they're facing a confirmation hearing, right? In, in other words, if we believe in judicial activism, for example, do we let our senators know, hey, I believe in this particular philosophy and this judge uh, does, not, does not believe in that way, I, 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 I would like for you to vote against them or vice versa, whatever the case may be. You, you see what I'm getting at. But the point is, do we voice that? Another good question. All right. Well, this actually is going to wrap up this video. This uh, We are done with the lecture part here. So if there's any questions, comments, or concerns that you may have about the judiciary, send them my way. I'm here to help. That being said, we will catch you in the next lecture. Until then, peace.